Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, fighting the power and coming to the Go Talk and not going to the Java Talk. Um, so uh, my name is Richard Crowley, and uh, I'm really excited to be at Strange Loop because I went to WashU and I love coming back to St. Louis. So this is, I think, one of the best conferences there is right now. And I'm very excited to be a part of it. I work for a company called Bettable. It's gambling as a service. No kidding. Uh, we do the money. We do the math. We make it so any old game developer can build legal gambling apps themselves, get into the market and compete in a way that they couldn't before. It's fantastic fun. I'm here to talk about scalability. And because this is mostly about programming and how we build services in a particular language, a lot of the, the points of scalability are actually about how it scales to a development team, to more engineers, to more features, and then only sort of tangentially to how it scales to many systems. As you get bigger and bigger, that ladder becomes a lot more important. And so there are avenues where I feel like Go sets you up to succeed in that regard. But we're going to spend time talking about both of them today. So uh, this is going to be audience participation time. Raise your hand if you've written at least one Go program. Fantastic. Raise your hand if you have Go in production. Also fantastic. One guy's shaking his hand. Used to. Used to. Let's talk later. <laughs> Who has only Go in production? I can't claim that that's the case for myself either, but I'd love to get there. Uh, who thinks Go's a little too mainstream now? <laughs> yeah? OK. <laughs> Hipsters. So there's a lot of good reasons to choose any programming language. And there, I feel like I wanted to call out a few of the good reasons to choose Go. One of them is the, the brevity in how you can express yourself. I shouldn't say more about that. One is the static type system. And that's a, a religious argument. And so I'm not going to say more about that either, or I'll, or I'll lose my whole time. But it gives you a lot of interesting properties and, and the ability to reason about the correctness and the safety of your program. And that's very important. Another is that it compiles to x86 and to ARM and to whatever, which makes it easy to ship, which to some approximation makes it easy to make a performance system. And then there's this, uh, this communicating sequential processes primitive that's baked into the language. And Rich Hickey talked about it at length yesterday. I'm going to talk about it a little bit today. It's a fantastic feature. And though it may be one of the like really shiny ones, it's also one of the parts that makes Go really special. And then there's the, the people behind it, Ken Thompson you know, of Unix, Rob Pike and Russ Cox that worked on Plan 9 at Bell Labs, one of the would-be evolutions of Unix, Robert Greisimer, who worked on Hotspot and V8, serious technical power that I would really like to stand on the shoulders of. And then there's Brad Fitz, who I put in a different category because he does a different thing. He does this one really annoying thing where he solves the hard problem before I get to it so that I can use his code. And it's no fun, but it means that the standard library in, that Go ships with is getting a ton of love, and it's getting better all the time, and it's becoming one of the real competitive advantages for the language. So the fact that he's working on it and making that happen is a huge plus. But there's also bad reasons to choose Go. And I'm totally guilty of this, uh, not for the stuff that we have in production. I feel like we did our homework there. But it's not Java, and it doesn't run on the JVM. And thanks for fighting the power. Sorry, was that redundant? <laughs> uh, it's actually a bad reason to choose Go. If you look deeper, I feel like the, thing, the real problems that people have with Java come out, and, and when you evaluate them, on their merits and not on the, the religious and superficial reasons, a lot of times Go will come out on top, and a lot of times it won't. So a couple ways that it won't is if, for some reason, the problem that you're working on won't tolerate a more naive garbage collector. Perhaps you just can't help but create a lot of garbage. That's a thing, and that's possible. And if so, maybe, maybe you choose not to use Go. Perhaps you have some weird legacy dependency that you would have to do the work to integrate with that system if you were to use Go and you don't have the bandwidth on your team. That's also a valid reason. If, though, that's an open source thing, I would hope that you kind of pay it forward and, and do the work to open source that. Anyway, the spoiler is that we're, we've chosen Go, because I'm here to talk about Go. And rule number one of Go is that you always, always, always Google Golang, or you're going to have a bad time. Never Google for Go. You're going to get stuff about games. You're going to get driving directions. It's not fun. So now some code. Um, is this legible enough back there, or should I bump it up one? 
No news is good news. All right. So we're going to skip hello world and do hello dub dub dub. And the interesting parts of this are how short it actually is. So beyond just the structure of being a Go program, we've got a function in the middle here with a curious signature. It takes a response writer and a request. That's all I'll say right now. I'm just pointing out that it's there. But we're using some global magic here to set up a handler for slash and then serve port 8080. That's, that's all this does. And it'll serve hello dub 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 all day long. So we've got a function, and it has a particular signature. And in fact, in Go, you can, much like a normal language, take any number of parameters. But you can also return any number of parameters. And this is uh, both as a way out of a couple of other design features and also an awesome feature all on its own. Every sort of function is a closure if you squint at it just right. And otherwise, they're pretty unsurprising. So this bit about multiple return values, I think, is important to call out and to really make the, the framing around it right. Conventionally, the last of your return values, or the only of your return values, is an error. And that's a global type in the language. It's an interface that you can implement. And this is what you use instead of exceptions. There are no exceptions in Go. And this is on purpose, and it's, it's meant to force an attitude adjustment. Errors are not exceptional cases. Errors are just something that happened. And a nil error is an indication that something happened, just the same as, a, as an eperm error. Using the error as an opportunity to communicate what that was that happened to the caller is an important uh, uh, responsibility of the implementer of a function. And that having it be an error rather than exception forces the caller to deal with it and to understand the consequences of what they've done. So this, I feel like it's a feature. And Maybe I'm twisted. Maybe I've had too much Kool-Aid. But that's the pitch for the no exceptions thing in Go, should you be curious. So moving back into the language, there's also structs. I want to go through a couple of the bits of the language very quickly to set some, some baseline here. Structs only have data in them. So you don't declare a, a struct like you would a class in C++ or Java. It's just a bucket of data. And everything has a type, and it has order, and it has structure and memory that you control, which is very important. Then you can attach methods. And you can attach metho methods to absolutely anything. You can attach methods to int. You can attach methods to the empty struct that takes up zero bytes in memory. Think about that for a minute. And here we've got the same signature on this method that we had on our function. Serve HTTP takes a response writer and a request, just like before. And in fact, this function is exactly the same, plus we're using our receiver to increment a counter. And this, this signature is important to us because of the next thing, the cool. The magic part of Go is the interface, which is akin to a struct, which is a bucket of data. An interface is a bucket of method signatures. It has no data. It can't have data. It's a type that declares a bunch of method signatures, just like one would in Java. But the difference is you don't have to declare that you implement an interface. If you happen to, the compiler will allow you to use your value as something that expects that interface, a, a parameter to a method or a member of a struct, perhaps. Notice the bottom struct there defines a serve HTTP method with this signature that we've now seen four times. This is what it means to play the HTTP game in Go. And this is the building block on which we've built all of the things that we use to build web services at Bettable. So we're going to rewrite now our HTTP example. And we're going to not use the, the goofy fast path global stuff. We're going to build it ourselves so we understand the pieces that are involved. So the top two lines, we're creating this thing called a serve mux. This is a router. It takes URL patterns and turns them into a handler that it can call that serve HTTP method on. We're registering the handler we defined a couple slides ago, that the one that had the method that was the real first class kind of thing. And then we're creating a server with that handler. Now, this serve mux thing is itself a handler that dispatches to other handlers. So we're starting to see how the turtles are stacking up, right? Then we're going to decompose the listen and serve that we had before into a listener and the serve method. And that's relatively unsurprising. We're going to do that to lead ourselves into the next couple of examples. But the important thing about this, that this is the same program as we had before logically. It's decomposed into its parts so that we can get at them and change them a little bit. Now, another bit of audience participation. 
Who's been burned by base HTTP server or web brick or something like that, some crap standard library server? It's some, some honest people here. The rest of you are kidding yourselves. Everybody's been burned by this. It doesn't behave like a real web server. It isn't a real web server. So we're right to be suspicious of what Go's standard library web server does. So we're going to figure out what it does by way of an analogy. We're going to strip away the HTTP stuff, and we're going to build an echo server. So carrying from the last slide where we had the, the raw net.listen call that builds a listening socket on our network, we have that same idea here, listen on port 1234, and then we enter a loop. And in Go, the for loop with no anything is just forever. So we're going to loop forever, and we're going to accept on our listener. This is pretty normal, right? You call the accept system call, you get back a socket. In this case, we get a connection, a little bit more hydrated object. And then we go handle con. It reads like English. This go keyword in the language takes any function call that you can possibly write, and it spawns what's called a go routine, a new go routine, and it runs that function there. And there's two interesting things. One, you can never, ever know for sure, just as this is, whether that Go routine is running, or has run, or has not run, or has died, or errored. There's no inherent return value from that. And the other is that because it's, this is not spawning a thread, we get to take advantage of a lot of real nice properties. So in this Go routine, in this off to the side asynchronous thing, we have another function. And there's a couple of quick things. At the top, we use the defer feature of the language, which is really sweet. It's kind of a finally sort of setup, where con.close is going to be called at the end of the function, no matter what, no matter how it returns. And then we create a buffer for our, self, for, for our echo server. And then we go into another forever sort of loop, where we read and then write, and then read and then write all day long. That's it. That's an echo server. Now, this is really nice, because all we're really ex expressing here, with the exception of allocating a buffer is exactly the, the, the logic that we want to happen. We want to read, and then we want to write exactly that same thing out. No callbacks, no state machines, no, no nonsense. This go routine per connection pattern smells fishy, though, right? It smells like uh, Apache Max worker or something or others. And it seems like something we should cap. And in reality, the runtime is doing that capping for us. There's an environment variable called gomaxprox that will limit the number of actually running pthreads, if you're on Linux, and multiplex your million go routines onto those eight pthreads, or whatever you would decide to run. And so this, this coupled with the fact that they, the stacks of these go routines are segmented, so they're, they're low memory footprint, means you can actually run many, many thousands of them at a time. And proof's in the pudding. This is how the standard library HTTP server that powers all downloads at Google actually works. Now, this is the first part of what Rich Hickey spent a lot of time talking about yesterday. And I'm going to mimic a little bit of that. Is this communicating sequential processes research, I guess you'd say, that underlies a lot of this. So the Go routines are the sequential processes. And this stuff was set out in, in beginning in 1978 by Tony Hoare. And the, the Go authors summarized it relatively nicely in the, the Effective Go article, which is a great read. They say, do not communicate by sharing memory. Instead, share memory by communicating. And this is where we need the communicating part of this to come together so that we have the tools available to us to do both this you know, wide fan out sort of connection handling stuff as well as isolation of critical sections and connection pooling and things like that. So we've had the Go routines. They're called parallel commands in the research, if you look deeper into it. And now for channels, the, this is the communicating part. And these are called input-output commands in the, the research, if you go look. So the top two lines of code there declare two channels. One of them is <clears throat> unbuffered. And, and that means that it is totally synchronous. When you send, there has to be someone to receive it. The other one is buffered, so there's this sort of immediate uh, immediate queuing plus back pressure when the queue is full. So you get the nice failure degradation that you want when your queues are backed up. Uh, as Rich noted yesterday, unbounded queues are a recipe for disaster. It's asking to handle that bug later. 
Uh, I did some benchmarking on this because I was curious how they stacked up against mutexes. And the truth is, because the, the semaphore implementation within channels is so purpose-built, is so ingrained to it, it's actually really fast to the point that allocating a channel and then using it once is fast enough that you don't, you would want to do that over using a mutex for a lot of jobs. But, and there's a downside here, when you're dealing with an OLTP kind of workflow, workload, when you're dealing with web services, the temptation to use these new exciting hammers, the, the shiny features of Go is, is really there, but I think it's, it's worth taking caution before you, you jump right in. Because you're sacrificing a couple of things. First, you're sacrificing the ability to, to scale out in the small. And I mean in the same sense that you have another web server over here that handles the same sort of traffic but is unrelated, you can have another Go routine over here that handles the same sort of traffic but is, is un, unaware of the other guy. And the ability to buy better hardware that can run four times as many Go routines is a scalability technique that you prevent by having too tightly coupled a system of Go routines within one process. The other uh, opportunity to really shoot yourself in the foot by relying too heavily on the CSP primitives is that all of those queues that may have data in them have to be drained carefully. Otherwise, you open yourself up to data loss opportunities in, a, in what's usually a very stateless transient system. So the sort of poster child for this in my mind is the, is the thought experiment of how you gracefully stop a web server. Really, you just stop listening and then let everybody finish, right? That's easy to some degree. And yet, if you have a bunch of queues you need to drain, it's a process that takes a lot of care. So the HTTP package here, uh, while it's been awesome so far, is annoyingly unhelpful. And, uh, and partially, this is the community's fault for not being able to agree on exactly what graceful stop means. But we can take matters into our own hands slightly with what I'm calling clumsy stop. So we're adding two things to our example from before. The first is a channel of signals, which we're going to use to just let the runtime tell us about sigint and sigterm whenever they happen to show up. And then instead of serving, we're going to go serve our web server over in another go routine. And that means that we have this main go routine that we're executing in to block on the channel, and then we can clean up after ourselves. And the, the clumsy part is that the cleanup is just close the listener so there'll be no new connections, and then wait for one minute, assuming everybody's going to be done that quickly. Now, you can make any sort of clever system you want to keep track of your running connections, your, your open requests, and shut them down gracefully. And hopefully, the standard library will expose enough of its internals to let us do that in a very elegant way soon. But for the moment, even this is graceful. The downside is that it's a one minute outage every time you deploy. But we can do better. We can augment that further. Same example, but replace the, the raw signal handling with this go again library that handles the sort of Unix style fork a child, let it inherit the listener, and then kill the parent pattern. And all we need to do to use that is replace the signal channel with await signals and the listening with conditionally listening or inheriting. And now, as long as you use uh, something that's not upstart or daemon tools to supervise your services, you can gracefully stop while actually performing a zero downtime restart so your new process takes over instantaneously. Cool stuff, right? We still just have a plain old web server here. And so that's as, low, that's as low down to the bottom as I want to go. I want to start back at our hello www and go higher level now and talk about uh, web frameworks and building web services and the APIs that we use day to day. There's a lot of stuff going on in this space right now. Much of it we have cribbed from aggressively. And so depending on your exact needs or your curiosities, I encourage you to check them out. Gorilla and Revel are very ambitious, very high feature things that I think are awesome for building full web apps. Go REST is interesting but hides so much information from the compiler and turns so much into runtime concerns that it's, in my mind, tricky to debug. And then there's a lot more things like Pat and, and sort of the, the small pieces that you can join together. And so let's talk more about this over beers if you're interested or curious or if I've left something off, I apologize. Well, what I really wanted to talk about is, uh, is what we've been doing. And we bundled it up 
in homage to Drop Wizard uh, under the name Tiger Tonic. And I was going to do like a grand reveal here, but internet. So uh, this is already open source as of an hour ago. And this is a collection of things. I hesitate to even call it a framework. It's a collection of the, the pretty version of what I'm going to talk about for some of the rest of the talk that we use pretty happily at Bettable. So routing. What we used in the, in the example before, the, the serve mux from the standard library, is busted because it only routes prefixes. So you, just, you end up with a tree of handlers that you have to define yourself, and you have to edit yourself, and it's just a ton of source code. So we define this try serve mux thing that is aware of HTTP methods, is aware of wildcards, and handles this, the, the routing and the treeness of it internally so you don't have to. And that gives us the opportunity to automate away responding 404 and 405 and pull all those wildcards from the middle of the nice human readable URLs into the parameters where you can get at them programmatically. And then there's JSON, because realistically, to me at least, web services mean JSON these days. So that would have meant wrapping our response writer from our handler in a JSON encoder. And it actually is a relatively elegant thing because of that writer interface in, J in Go that everything can kind of be a writer or be a reader, and you can plug them together. But it's awkward, and it's verbose. So we thought we could do better. And we thought, now we think we've done a lot better. Because what we have is a different, method func uh, different function signature that takes in a URL header and a request. And that request is a real object with a real type that you can test and manipulate as schema, almost. And likewise, there's a response that you can do the same thing with. And it's some complete description of the data you want to take in and the data you want to take out. And the ugly reflection stuff happens behind the scenes. And the best part is it all still boils down to an HTTP handler. So you can still plug it in wherever you want in a, in a larger Go HTTP infrastructure. And because we're doing this stuff, we have an opportunity to automate away some of the common errors to make using these APIs much easier. So the reflection bit is interesting because, well, one, because Go's reflection package is awesome. So much better than anything I've ever used in this area before. Um, and so we use it in a couple of places in this JSON code that I think is interesting. So at the top, what we're doing is using reflection to look at the method that you provided to us grab the, the positional parameter and grab the type of it so that we can create a, an object of the type that you expect and deserialize the JSON into it so that you get the actual object of the type that you want and there's no casting and goofiness going on. And then on the way back out, it's sort of it's easy because you just return some value. And it's easy to take any value and turn it into JSON. That's, that's the easy side. But that could cause errors to show up very late in your runtime process. You could have an API that never gets called for a month and suddenly explodes because you had a type error. So we try to move a lot of the uh, control over what you're putting into the system and make sure your, your signatures are, are sort of fuzzy correct up to the beginning of runtime in the init functions in the early part of registering and, and building up your service. Um, we also added stuff which this comes up a thousand times a day. I want to handle this request as long as you're authorized, or the sky's blue, or you're in Great Britain, which is a thing for us. Um, so we conditionally handle requests by building another HTTP handler that calls a function. And if that function returns a nil error, then we call the real handler. And we use this all the time. Um, it's a special case of sort of a middleware chaining thing which is less useful, honestly, than just conditionally handling requests. And still, it's just a handler. Now, a slight subject change um, from the programmer you know, in-your-face bits of building web service endpoints to how we think about our, pr our production services, how we know that they're functioning correctly, how we know that we're meeting our goals. And these are visibility problems. And there's, there's micro and macro visibility problems. And you solve the micro problems with logs, where you can see what's going on. And you solve, in my opinion, the macro problems with the metrics, the numbers, the, the aggregates. And uh, on the logging front, we, we actually 
use this log thing, which logs full request and response bodies, which is the best thing you can do as long as you're careful not to log credit card numbers. There is no debugging tool like exactly what happened, seriously. There's also Apache log for people that don't believe me. Um, then, there's, then there's metrics. There's the, the big picture stuff, how, how healthy the service is, how, how well we're responding, how quickly we're doing so, how shitty our 99 percentile latency is. Uh, all this stuff is just wrapping up Go metrics, which is a port of Coda Hale's Java metrics, which is all very much in line with what Avi Bryant was talking about this morning with understanding how to properly take sums of sums and averages of averages to get meaningful numbers so that you're not just looking at junk. So we dump all this stuff on the, the outside into a couple of tools, one's called Statsny and one's called Graphite, to look at the last hour and all of time and have a lot of success with that. There's a lot of other batteries. I don't want to waste all of my or your time talking about stuff we open sourced, but there's the sorts of things that we've found the need for, and so they're there. I want to take a step further back now and talk really about how these web services, or how any web services work. So it's all about being confident that they do, and before you even start logging or collecting metrics, you test, right? And I wanted to call this out particularly because of the reputation for statically typed languages to be tough to test. So it's only four bullet points. You can create request objects very easily in Go, and that's a tribute to the way that the standard library parses a request and gives it to you in a digestible manner. It's not a, a stream of headers that you have to on header event stuff. It's just an object, so you can fake it. Then you can call those serve HTTP methods because it's handlers all the way down, right? And when you need to give it a response writer, you give it a response recorder because a response writer is an interface, it turns out, and a response recorder will give you access to everything that happens. So then after the fact, after serve HTTP returns, you can assert that the body is what it's supposed to be, that the headers are all there, that the response code's right. Or if you're doing the JSON thing, like we are 100% of the time, you can call the marshaled function directly and whatever type you put in, you put in, and whatever type you get out, you'll get out, and then you can make assertions on that real type at a higher level than you know, stir pausing your JSON, because that's, that's error prone. So now we're confident and we're ready to go to production, right? Uh, and I would say yeah, but truthfully, uh, no, you're not there yet. Dependency hell is a real thing, even in brand new languages, I I'm sorry to say. And the way that Go invites you to install dependencies is with this Go get tool. And it is going to bite you sooner or later, and probably sooner. Essentially, it always installs master. And so you, you have a few options to deal with that. There are some Go-specific solutions, which are called GoPack and Johnny Depps. Um, both of them do roughly the same thing. They keep a list of the repository URLs and the SHAs that you want from them. And to me, that's, that's the same thing as, go, uh, as a git submodule. So I say, use git submodule. Yeah, you have to do one thing after you clone, but it's, it's fine. Google says vendor third-party code. And they're not wrong, but we take a slightly uh, more humane approach where we vendor whatever at the point of continuous integration, whatever passed all the tests, we vendor that. So at least we know that everything that passed test goes with us to staging, goes with us to, to production. And coupling that with uh, forking all of our third party dependencies to our own GitHub means we're pretty confident that nothing's getting through without getting tested. So now really we're ready to go to production. And the next question somebody's going to ask you is, well, did you put Nginx in front of it or Apache or whatever you want to do? Um, and that's a subtle question for a number of reasons. It depends on a lot of other things. But for the Go web services we're building, I say at this point, no. Now, we're a financial institution, essentially. So we do SSL absolutely everywhere, between everything all the time. The only thing that doesn't SSL is localhost. And so we do TLS termination in Tiger Tonic web apps. And that's made very easy by the Go standard library has a couple of benefits, it turns out. There's no crypto step to block your Nginx event loop. That's a thing. 
and there's one fewer hops, which at some marginal level is going to increase, uh, or sorry, decrease your latency. And this TLS thing, I, I put up a code sample because uh, it's a little bit daunting for everybody, and uh, OpenSSL makes it worse, and Go's stuff doesn't make it a lot better. Uh, but that's how you create a TLS listener in Go. The way that you don't shoot yourself in the foot with this is to always use the net.con and net.listener interfaces, and that allows you to, uh, to handle TLS connections, non-TLS connections, uh, switch it out for OpenSSL later, and there's this baseline of functionality that it doesn't matter what kind of listener you have as long as it can accept connections, and that's, that's the level of thing that we're after here. That's true. Who said that? There, I, I, there, there are some specific options, and the same is true for Unix domain sockets. And the reality there, um, well, there's, I guess, a couple things. When you create your TLS listener, you can actually create it from a TCP listener. So you can have sort of a two-step listener creation process. That's how you would do things like set deadlines on your listener. Man's right, though. But long before you get to the, the wastefulness of, of Go's SSL or anything like that, it's, there's going to be some inefficiency in your program. There's going to be some scalability problem in, in your program, I think. Nothing against you. My programs, too. And the, the philosophy there is, is really to waste not, to understand when variables you're allocating, memory that you're allocating gets promoted to the heap so that it's eligible for garbage collection, to be conscious of reusing those buffers so that you're allocating as little as possible. Because ultimately, same as in any garbage collected language, the small heap is the fast heap. And you don't get out of this by having native code. You don't get out of this by uh, Rob Pike being smarter than you. It's just a reality of life. The good side is that the fact that you control the memory layout so delicately in Go means you actually have an opportunity to incredibly strongly influence how the garbage collector perceives what you're doing. You actually have the opportunity to create less garbage. It's, it's a wonderful thing. We've talked a whole bunch about the, the standard library and building HTTP handlers. And more generally, I would encourage you to use those, those tools to their fullest effect, to make your deviations small and work within the standard library functionality where absolutely possible, because all the batteries that come you know, around the edges, the network level stuff, the TLS stuff, the par parts of the built-in HTTP stuff that aren't goofy prefix routers are good. And the more that you can take advantage of that, the faster you're going to build more performant, more scalable systems. And then we talked about errors very early on and the fact that it's your opportunity to communicate what went wrong. If you're building all these small handlers that are isolated and, and reusable, because the, you know, the whole point of things like if is to be able to decouple your handler from the conditions under which it's allowed to be called, all these pieces need to be able to fail fast, and they need to be able to fail in a way that you can understand what went wrong, both as a developer and programmatically, so that the error can be propagated correctly. We talked about shared nothing a lot, and the fact that Though we accept in the large that being able to scale out to n plus 1 machines is totally obvious and not worth talking about, I think it's important to remember that computers are still getting better, especially at doing the same thing in an uncoordinated manner n plus 1 times. So make sure that as you build systems, you're able to take advantage of diagonal scaling when, it, when the opportunity arises. And that means that the concurrency primitives should be used delicately and used purposely. When you have something that truly does need to be limited in terms of the number of in-flight requests, and it, you, know, you have a delicate uh, outside service or an API with rate limits or any number of things, the primitives that Go gives you can be an incredibly expressive way to model it, but you can also artificially limit the throughput and the, and the performance and the scalability of your systems. And then, of course, we need to measure everything, because flying blind is by no means a way to build any sort of service that performs respectably for users. So in the, in the large, we talk about counting and timing things, looking at our logs when they indicate that there are problems. But in the small, there's really cool 
uh, tools it hooks into the PProf profiler that you can call with literally two lines of setup. It's silly. Like most of my programs have command line options to enable CPU profile because it adds two lines and an if statement. It's, it's really quite good. And then it's all integrated into the language and it'll actually fire up a browser with call graphs in it. It's, it's slick. So in, in total summary, if you're building web services in Go, I, I encourage you to use handlers to the absolute greatest degree you possibly can and to stick with something that will allow you to escape off to the side when you need to do something different. Use the concurrency primitives where you have sort of pipelined things that, that actually the sort of prob problems that Rich talked about yesterday are perfect fits for concurrency, but I think generally speaking, OLTP workloads are a little bit simpler and, uh, and better served by simpler solutions. So bridge the gap between the, the Go routine per connection and the pipeline sort of designs cautiously. And remember that the error case is not the exceptional case in any distributed scalable system. So here's some links to a lot of the stuff that I talked about so that you don't have to go Googling. Johnny Depp's surprisingly not going to turn up a GitHub page. Um, really? As of like yesterday? Huh. Thanks. <laughs> so if you, would, uh, if you would like to work on awesome gambling problems and maybe write some Go code, this is how you work at Bettable. Thank you.